So, uh, with those introductory remarks, let me move, of course, to uh, the main part uh, of today, that is a program where we will begin, uh, Professor Lynn Kagan, uh, with a presentation from yourself and then colleagues that you'll introduce uh, following your own overview. Let me just be clear about this. Um, Lynn, of course, is known to everybody in this room uh, and globally, not only because, of course, of uh, your work at Teachers College, uh, Columbia and also Yale, but because, of course, you co-direct the National Centre for Children and Families. But in the wider sphere as writer and author and as world-renowned authority in the early years, you have brought this agenda to us in the most remarkable and powerful way with your colleagues. So we want to acknowledge this morning that not only do you have that international global reputation, but as far as we're concerned here in the US, you are a national treasure. So colleagues, would you please with me warmly welcome Professor Lynn Kagan. We know that. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, both Betsy and Tony, for those wonderful introductions. Thank you who are in the room for coming, weathering the rain. Thank you for those of you who are listening. And thank you for those who have traveled a long way to be here. We really, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Much of the work that we are going to be reporting on rests on the shoulders of two giants who actually physically are at rest now, recently, but they are very much alive in our hearts. I would like to acknowledge the incredible contributions to our field and to many of us as individuals of David Hamburg, who spent much of his life in this very building, and of course, to my very precious mentor, Edward Ziegler. Adorable five-year-old Sarah pounded on the drugstore floor with her feet as she begged me to buy her a big pack of bubblegum. She proffered every possible rationale for its purchase, but finally, exasperatedly, when I wouldn't budge, she put her hands on her hips and she looked up at me and she said, Auntie Linny, here is the very real truth. <laughs> My mother really wants me to have that bubble gum. <laughs> True story. Sarah has grown up a lot. Her childhood truths have given way to the realities of a beautiful life. But Sarah's story is our story. We are here to understand some tenaciously sticky, inconvenient truths that actually are impeding us to achieve our bubblegum, our wants on behalf of young children. We're also here to learn how others' experiences from around the world might help us to address them. So, along with my wonderful colleagues and our terrifically supportive funders, I am really very honored to present the early advantage to you. Let us begin with some of the real and inconvenient truths. We all know the real truths. We all know that there have been considerable advances in our scientific knowledge including everything from the neurosciences to the evaluation sciences to implementation sciences. We all know that there have been tremendous advances in policy. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 4.2, the first time that early childhood services have ever been acknowledged in such a document. We also know that there are incredible increases in the provision of early childhood globally. We know in our own country that there have been important advances in practice, a greater focus on quality, on equity, and certainly contemporarily on workforce issues. But if we're honest, if we really acknowledge our real truths, 
We also know that there are some very inconvenient facts, inconvenient presumptions, and a very inconvenient context that indeed strongly influences our work. Let me begin with one inconvenient fact about investment. Note where the United States falls amongst leading countries in the world in our expenditures on pre-primary education as a percent of total education expenditures. Note where the United States falls on 10 commonly used indicators of quality. And perhaps most abysmally, note where the United States falls on the availability of preschool services for children when compared with countries around the world. This is somewhat inexcusable for a country as great as ours. But it's not just those inconvenient facts. There are some inconvenient presumptions that contour the way we think about services for young children. Let me share just a few. We presume that it actually is government's responsibility to fully fund ECEC, knowing in our heads and hearts that the federal government and state governments alone will probably never be able to fund comprehensive early childhood services to the levels of quality and equity that we want. We know that. We presume that the results from our funded evaluation studies should contour policy. After all, we want to translate scientific knowledge to policy, knowing in our heads and hearts that many of the very studies that we are relying on don't really effectively measure what we think really matters for children and for families. And finally, we consistently lament that early childhood is not yet a profession. We do a lot of woe is me about how we are under-recognized, undervalued, and underappreciated. At the exact same time that we base our quests for more funding and more support on that very concept of professionalism. And finally, let me address our American context. Those of us who live in this country understand that yes, we are one of the greatest countries on earth. Under the truth of democracy, however, we also acknowledge that we have a very partisan system of governance. Under the truth of freedom and justice, we acknowledge slavery, Jim Crow, racism, sexism, and a host of other prevalent isms that persist. And under the truth of loving children and of honoring their families, our country actually fails miserably. Indeed, it is these three sets of inconvenient truths that have led to the study, the early advantage. Let me tell you a bit about the study. We had three goals. We wanted to really learn from the best countries and the best scholars. We wanted to create a scientifically rigorous study. And we desperately wanted to produce products that would be useful to affect social change. In terms of selecting the countries, we used two concrete data sets, PISA, and we chose from amongst the top scoring 10 countries on PISA and the Economist Intelligence Unit Report, which measured the quality of early childhood services in 45 countries around the world. When we cross-hatched those, we ended up with, as you can see, countries in all of the cells. And I'll speak to, although Australia was not in the top of either PISA or the Economist Intelligence Unit, Australia, as we will hear, is doing some remarkably important things. And that's why we chose it. But it wasn't enough just to choose wonderful countries. We needed to choose terrific scholars in those countries. And indeed, this study was blessed by an incredible team of very, very collaborative individuals. In a few moments, you are going to hear from three of them, from Kathy Silva from England, from Christina Kumpulainen from Finland, and from Nirmala Rao from Hong Kong. But we would be terribly remiss if we did not also acknowledge the incredible contributions of Myung Moon from South Korea, 
of Rebecca Bull, the Singapore PI, who actually is now in Australia, and of our dearly beloved former Colette Taylor from Australia. Colette passed midway through this study and her work was amply supported by Bridget Healy. Bridget, I want to acknowledge and thank you for the incredible work you did. And there are others in this audience who also deem acknowledgement who you will not be hearing from. Samantha Melvin worked terribly, terribly hard on this. And I want to acknowledge Jean Reed. And also you will be hearing from Eva Landsberg shortly. So it was quite an incredible team. We were blessed. We wanted to create a very rigorous study. And indeed, we had a very clear design. We reviewed the 16 international studies that looked at early childhood systems. We developed a robust set of research questions that looked at what is going on, how are things being accomplished, and why. Why did these systems evolve as they did? We grounded our work in theory, a robust systems framework. We looked at a theory of change, and we also posited diverse outcomes that extend our conventional thinking beyond quality to include quality, equity, sustainability, and efficiency. And finally, we implemented a very solid data analysis. We used common data tools that we developed collaboratively. And indeed, we imposed upon ourselves a very rigorous validation process where our work was reviewed by experts who were not involved in the study in each of the study countries. We feel confident of our findings, though we should point out that our field is changing dramatically. So our findings are accurate as of the end of the study, December. Um, but indeed, things are changing rapidly, and we'll get to hear a little bit about that. In terms of producing products for diverse audiences, the two books um, that we have that have emanated from this study are widely available. But in addition, I would commend your attention to the wonderful websites that have just been announced because they contain very detailed case studies. No, no, I hope you'll show yours. And they also contain um, facts at a glance about these countries if you are interested in more information about anyone in particular. So let's move to the findings. What did we really find in this study? Three major framing findings stand out. The importance of context, the importance of multiple bests, and the importance of synergies. And you're probably thinking, well, what is she talking about? What is really new about this? Just wait. The importance of context. Um, Certainly, we selected countries because they did have very historical contexts that were different. They have very different cultural contexts, and they have political contexts that also are very, very different. And indeed, it is important to acknowledge the framing impact of those socio-cultural contexts, which don't change very much even though the econo-political contexts do change. These countries look very different. And we are not suggesting that Finland actually is the exemplar of the Nordic approach, or that Hong Kong is the exemplar of Asian, or that, Anglo that England is the exemplar of the Anglo approach, although I think they do a pretty darn good job, as you will hear. But the reality is that these contexts are profoundly important. They are not necessarily constant and they are highly influential. Let me give you some examples. In Finland, where trust in government and trust in teachers is very, very strong, we see very limited monitoring. There is no need, because staff are professionally trained. This is part of their ethos. In Singapore, where we see a huge spirit of innovation, a lot of policy borrowing going on, we see the ability to rapidly extend services and to invest in very innovative pilot strategies that transcend all dimensions of early childhood. And finally, in Australia, that has a very diverse population and a majestic commitment to its indigenous populations, we actually see a respect for this diversity throughout every facet of its work. So context really does contour. Now here's the dilemma. 
our policy strategies tend to be built on let's pilot it, let's replicate what evaluation shows us works, <coughs> despite the problems with some of our evaluation metrics. But we face huge replicability and scalability issues. This study teaches us that context matters, context contours policy and practice, and that we as a nation need to be very respectful of our uniquely American context, and I'll speak to that momentarily. The second strategy, the importance of multiple bests. There is no question that each of these countries, all of the six, provide more comprehensive direct services than we in the United States do. They provide them in the four buckets that you see on the screen, pre and perinatal, with almost all of the countries having very robust paid family leave. They all have some form of rich child care and health care, and they all have home visiting services that extend well beyond infancy into toddlerhood. In toddlerhood, many of the countries have very, very strong subsidies. In preschool, all of them have preschool and some have required attendance at reception classes. We'll hear about that. And interestingly, all focus on the transitions that young children make as they move from the preschool context to the school context. These are very, very important services. Please note, they all don't do exactly the same thing. They all don't do all of these, but they all have some services in each of these buckets that we would contend actually transcend what we in this country are doing, particularly when you look at pre and perinatal and our services to infants and toddlers domestically. But this idea about multiple bests, multiple ways to achieve things, is not only true of the direct services that children receive, but it's also true of the operational infrastructure. And by that, I don't mean schools and facilities, but I mean the kinds of things that support high quality programs. So let me give you an example. Um, if we take financing, a key important facet, and if we look at Korea, South Korea, we see that they focus on a heavy demand side approach. While Hong Kong, also focusing on financing, focuses on a supply side approach. Multiple bests to achieve funding in those unique contexts. If we look at pedagogy, by the way, all of the countries have national, and I want to distinguish national from federal here, have national frameworks that guide early childhood. In Singapore, a highly centralized system, this is comparatively easy to implement. In Australia, a country that is highly decentralized, much like our own, they too have a national quality framework that has been adopted by all the states and territories with some, indeed, modifications. And finally, when it comes to issues related to data collection and a comprehensive approach, England indeed does it and sees it as part of its DNA, while well, as Finland, on the other hand, as we have heard, indeed focuses less. The point of all of this is to say that our conventional strategy is to pick one program or one policy fad of the moment, often ignoring the need for all populations for services and often leaving very huge unserved pockets. This study tells us that we've got to accept the reality of multiple bests and we've got to pursue multiple direct services and multiple approaches to the infrastructure services. Third finding, the importance of synergy. Um, taking a lead from NCEE, this report, when we consolidated the data from all the countries, suggests that there are 15 different building blocks that are divided into five pillars that are really necessary to support high quality early childhood education and care programs. Let me elaborate on each and I'd like to give you some examples from some of the countries who are not present but who participated in the study. The first pillar is very strong policy foundations. We study countries that have supportive, stable, and adaptive contexts. That word adaptive is very, very important. 
There is strong ideological support for ECEC from government leaders and from the public. And there is also durable government structures and very capable, well-trained, well-paid ministry staff in most of the countries. Respecting context, I want to point out that Korea, suffering from the ravages of the war, ends up with a policy context that does five-year incremental plans. And from the very beginning when this started, early childhood was recognized and was a part of that five-year plan. They collect data, they revamp the plan, they are highly adaptive within the context of a very stable approach to policy. The second finding about pillar one is that policies that are created are consistently applied. They're applied to all programs. We don't have policies for program X and for program Y the way indeed we do in this country. And finally on pillar one, we engage stakeholders, constituents, and the public, and you will hear about strategies to do this in these countries. The second policy pillar relates to comprehensive services, funding, and governance. I've already discussed the comprehensive services, but I do want to say that we have had a terrible time grappling with distinctions, and we question what is early childhood. These countries are fairly clear. They distinguish between comprehensive early development, nomenclature that we adopted for this study, CED, as including all of the services that affect young children, health, nutrition, mental health, supportive services, and early childhood care and education, the kinds of services that this report really studied most. And they provide diverse options for both of those. The countries do provide sufficient funding for baseline services and also have additional funding for target populations. They hybridize public and private sector funding in ways that we should really try to emulate. They provide what we call progressive universalism, and I hope Nirmala will talk a little bit about that from the Hong Kong experience. Finally, the countries have coordinating mechanisms and governance structures. We will hear about those, but Singapore is a wonderful example through its early childhood development authority for comprehensive services. The third pillar, knowledgeable and supported families. These countries, while not achieving all of their goals related to having well-prepared, compensated, and well-respected workforces, are doing some things that are important for us to understand. They have established, many of them, not all, common professional titles that are accompanied by uniform job descriptions and entry requirements across program structures. They create common entry educational and licensure requirements. They deploy their staff very inventively. Sometimes they alter ratios dependent on ages and teacher qualifications. And finally, many create competencies that are linked to BAs to develop frameworks that are applied for everybody in the country. The countries take care with leadership, and I would point out that Singapore probably has the most advanced of these countries, a uh, career ladder that looks at competencies and has one entire track for leaders. They all engage families in programs. The fourth pillar, informed, individualized, and continuous pedagogy. As I mentioned, every single country has a national framework that emphasizes child-centered, play-based strategies. Having said that and having visited preschools in all of the countries, I can tell you they don't look all alike. High quality is different in all of these countries contoured to their contexts. They individualize for all children, and I know that Christina is going to talk to you about a very novel approach that I think is highly adaptive, individual education plans at preschool. But all of the countries, although they have these national curricula, allow and support teacher individualization to meet students' needs. And they all provide for continuity in children's experiences. The fifth pillar, data to drive improvement. These countries are not scared of collecting and using data for program improvement. Several of them collect national data on children, something that we have been a little bit frightened to do. They have very effective monitoring and inspection systems that support the national curriculum 
and they also have and produce affective research in many of the cases there are special entities set up by governments national institutes of early education and research korea is an example of that finally i want to suggest that it's not just these pillars exist exist but they exist with synergy that is to say in our country some of us work on pedagogy some of us work on finance some of us work on governance and we don't think inventively about how we can link all of these services let me give you an example so in several of the countries there are these national frameworks but they don't stop there they use the national frameworks to figure out what are the child data that should be collected what are the criteria for program monitoring this is all based on the national framework in a few of the countries, they use these frameworks as incentivizations for funding. If you meet the criteria in the framework, then you get additional funding. They use them to definitely support professional development with much of the professional development, both pre and in service, geared toward the national framework. You get the point that these building blocks don't exist separately. They really are synergistic and it's planned synergy, planned synergy. We tend to work in parallel policy lanes, giving voice without force to linkages. We need to begin to think about strategies for synergy, not just strategies for structures or strategies for geodelon, but synergistic strategies that really do address the entire system. So what do we do? Given this, what do we do? The book begins with Julius Richmond's important trilogy for social change. And in here, Julius says that we need only three things to achieve massive social change in any field. We need a well-codified knowledge base, we need public will, and I would add to that public courage, and we need a social strategy. Our work contends that we've done a pretty good job on the knowledge base. We're using it to support policymakers' actions. That indeed, we've done a very good job on public will, largely through the efforts of many people in this room. But indeed, it is the social strategy that we haven't really figured out. We're all spinning, we're all working hard, but we're not coalesced. So this report suggests that there are three steps. We need to acknowledge these inconvenient truths that are hampering our actions. We need to draw lessons from around the world. So the first and the second I've done, and we need to act anew. Here are findings from the studies. These study countries are all doing well. They were selected because they had lessons to teach us. But they are all doing well very differently. It is also important to note that these study countries face common challenges challenges related to workforce, to data, and you will hear all about this. The early advantage study indeed tried very hard to build on these findings and to unmuddy some essential definitions between comprehensive early development and early childhood education and care, to broaden the vision of outputs so that we collected data on all of these, we tried to place new emphasis on systems, both the direct services children receive and the operational supports. And finally, we really tried to honor people, time, the structures that exist, the cultures, and the context. What are our specific recommendations? There are five. And they parallel the actual three inconvenient truths. The first is about context. We need to consider diverse revenue generation and distribution approaches. We need to acknowledge that the United States is a highly inventive, highly entrepreneurial, and market-driven society. And so that we need to figure out how to better capitalize on what Howard Buffett calls social venture investment to really bring these, the public sector, the private sector, and philanthropy together in a way that capitalizes on them. I would suggest we've been too intellectually reliant on public sector provision, and there may be very inventive ways to think about funding this. Second, we need to acknowledge multiple bests. 
I went into this study thinking that every state in the country needed to have an early childhood governance structure. Rebecca Gomez is here. We worked on this together. But I want to underscore that we found examples of countries that don't have actual physical structures, but do achieve functional alignment by making sure that their guidances, their recommendations, their policy structures actually transcend individual programs. So we've learned there are multiple ways to achieve governance. Data for quality improvement, I think this is an area where the United States could really use a very, very big boost. We are not collecting it sufficiently, we are not organizing it sufficiently, and I would contend that despite notable efforts, we are actually not using it. With regard to synergies, we need to be far more inventive about how we are preparing the workforce. We will be having hot discussion about this, but I just want to say that this study points us toward understanding the need for common nomenclature, common titles, common specifications, and for diverse options, including competency as well as professional credentials to reach our goals. And finally, I want to point out the synergies that are affected by having a national framework. No, I am not suggesting that the government should do this. I am suggesting that we need to think hard nationally, however, about what we want for all children wherever they live. And we have good examples. We have authors in the room, Sue Bradykamp and Barbara Willer, who have developed important national frameworks for individuals in our own country and around the world to consider. And I'm suggesting it's time to revisit those, to look at some of the examples that we see in other countries, and develop a national, not a federal, approach for this. <coughs> Finally, I want to say that the real early advantage story returns us back to Sarah and to the bubble gum. We do have incessant desires and incessant wants, just like she did. And we do hold on to them tenaciously. But I want to share with you, if indeed we have learned anything from this study, it's that we can't shroud our wants in these inconvenient truths. Rather, our first job is to acknowledge them. Our second job is to learn from others, to ingest from the lived experiences of other countries, but only as a prelude to the third step which is to create our own social strategy that really does privilege the contextual realities of our country, and I would say of our states. Finally, we end the book with an appeal for multiple and synergistic bests, but above all, we plead for respect. We plead for respect for our American context, for the rich diversity of our population, and yes, even for our abysmally quirky, inchoate government and policy structures. Inconvenient though they may be, they are our very rich truths, the truths which must propel us forward as we work, plan, and go forward together. So onward, everyone. Um, I do want to end by just saying that the record should so show that I actually did accommodate Sarah's real truth and I did buy her the bubblegum. <laughs>